Uh, so Jim's going to have you on mute right now, unless you're a presenter or me, and I'm going to go ahead and facilitate this conversation. I'd like to start by uh, asking Shauna to answer a question for me. Why spend time working with parents when you have so many teachers that need you? What's your motivation? Why have you been spending so much time with parents? All right, good morning, Mark, and good morning, Sam's family. Again, my name is Shauna Fabui, proud principal of Allenwood Elementary School with my dynamic partner, Stephanie Gobo, and we are also uh, founders of the Academic Chariot, and that is an amazing question, Mark. Basically, we look at it as a partnership between the parents and the teachers. So one of the first things we said is that we have a new staff, and if we can build the capacity of our parents to support the academic trajectory of our students, then we can have a stronger foundation for our students. So we know the capacity of our teachers. We know that we have in-house collaborative planning and all sorts of professional development to help them. So we built our leadership team out to support our teachers and we've shifted our focus to our parents so that they can feel comfortable in their efforts to support the children. And so it's a partnership and it's been very successful through our parent university. Uh, congratulations, that's pretty cool. Paul, uh, let me ask you to chime in on this. Uh, you have an amazing background. You uh, were the Secretary of Education for the state of Massachusetts. You lead a change, you're a change agent really, because you lead a group looking at reinventing education at the university, at Harvard University. What do you think about what Sean has said and is it worth it to spend the time with parents? I, I think more than worth it. And thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on a panel with Shauna and Stephanie, who are on the front lines of doing this. I'll talk about it from my perch as a former practitioner, but now uh, sort of a professor of practice in a university dedicated to, to rethinking how we do education. I, my perspective on this, Mark, is that you know virtually overnight, we were catapulted into a new world in education. And uh, because of school closings and whatnot, you know, we rapidly moved to, you know, embracing technology, for example, that we have been relatively reluctant as a sector to do. If you looked at our performance relative to, for example, medicine or business, um, <clears throat> we've been slow in adapting and adopting uh, technology. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, over the years in general, I'm the present company accepted, but I'm talking about in general in our sector, we've given a lot of lip service to parents as being primary educators and, and first and foremost in children's lives and, <clears throat> and there for the long haul and so forth. But schools honestly have had relatively little time to deal with, address and engage parents on the whole. Again, I'm generalizing here. Uh, again, virtually overnight, uh, whether we like it or not, parents are now at the center of the educational enterprise, undeniably. And one of the weaknesses of our current education system, in my view, is our one-size-fits-all approach. In other words, we treat children as though they're all, you know, we confuse equality and equity. Right. Treating people equally is not the same thing as treating them fairly. Our children bring to us enormous differences in terms of assets and challenges and prior experience. And we need to build an education system that meets them where they are and gives them what they need. Well, if one size fits all doesn't work well for children, it works even less well for families. You know, imagine a family um, of, a, you know, a relatively young mother who's got two children under 10 years old. She's working two jobs in order to put food on the table. She doesn't have um, an internet connection and she has to be sure that her kids are gonna be remotely hooked up with school and supported in their learning. By contrast with another family in which you have um, two parents, one of whom's a professional working from home, one who's a full-time parent at home. They've got all the technology they need. They've got full internet connection and we're trying to put these kids on the same platform. Well, the families need different, different kinds of support and connection from the schools. And this, I like the word that Shauna used. Uh, it's um, something that's really important in a, in a framework developed by a colleague of mine, Karen Mapp, whose work, you know, she has a dual capacity framework and I'd recommend that to your attention, but it's, it's developing the capacity now in parents 
to be the primary educators. And so we have a deep interest in this. We can't be successful as educators in schools, as teachers and administrators, unless parents are successful in supporting their young people. So it makes this business of how we do it, uh, you know, which is what Shauna and um, Stephanie are engaged in, vitally important day to day and something that in redesigning education, we need to think about strengthening our capacity to connect in meaningful ways with parents. Well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Stephanie, let me pull you in here. Paul makes the point that there's an equity issue here. And you make that same point in the book that you wrote with Shauna, that there's an equity issue and there's a responsibility to bring parents in. But let me push back just a little bit. Don't you expand the inequity by involving parents because the parents you're going to involve are likely to be the ones who are already involved. If you say we're going to do a workshop, who comes? How do you get around that so you don't do something that you intend to make things more equal, but actually makes it more unequal? What do you say, Stephanie? That's a great question, Mark. And what this pandemic has done, it actually tasked all of us with reaching out to all 100% of our families, to engaging all of our families. And if we can find any silver lining in this pandemic, you know, we started the conversation off today and we were sharing the struggles of returning students back to school and te the positive tests that we have and how we go about. Those are real struggles that we are dealing with day in and day out. Um, putting devices in students' hands, putting meals in students' mouths. Those are equity issues that we are dealing with right now. But if we can find a silver lining in this pandemic, it's that we get to reset the relationships that we have with families. We get to change our mindset instead of focusing on what our families lack. You know, they lack time maybe, they lack interest. We may say they lack the fundamental education to help their child. We're gonna change that mindset and shift to what assets do our parents have? What are they bringing to the table? And do we even really know our parents? That's a really interesting question. And Shauna, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that, because I think you've dealt with that equity issue by getting to know your parents in a different way. Can you talk about how you've done that as a school? So as a school, we focus first and foremost on really making sure that that relationship building is authentic. And it becomes one of those catchphrases, you know, as educators, the first thing we know when we go into a school setting and become administrators, teachers, et cetera, that we wanna have a positive school culture. And it kind of gets wrapped up in that idea, but the authentic actual groundwork of building those relationships are time consuming and it's intimate. And so when we started thinking about how to genuinely build those relationships, in our process leading to the parent universities, prior to the parent universities, we needed to build those relationships. So pre-pandemic, we knocked at doors. We um, had what we call Roaring in the Community, where we went out every year and really make sure that not only our parents, but our community partners knew that we were there as a school and what resources we had to offer. And likewise, that allowed us to gain the resources that the community, such as our local businesses, as well as our parents' capacity could bring to the school. And in that turn, we kind of leveled some of the equity issues because we gave them access, access to us and we had access to them. And they felt, and when I say they, I'm speaking about the community partners, the parents, the students, the staff, everyone felt that they had a part in the success of the school and the success of the students because everyone was bringing something to the table. And as a result of that journey, we learned some very key um, needs that went from the assumptions of what our demographics were, language barriers, economic barriers, but we really got to know them as individuals to say, you know what, this parent might have a financial barrier. However, Mrs. Johnson, just pulling a name, has a need of um, clothing. And so we were able to directly connect with Mrs. Johnson rather than making a blanket statement that we have students in the category of poverty. And so knowing students one by one, parents one by one, and them trusting us, we're better able to build that relationship. 
And so now when we come into the virtual space, they know that we are connected to being a part of their success. And so they're willing to allow us to um, guide them in the academic space, which is what our goal is. Build that relationship intimately so that we're trusted as educators to extend their knowledge around the curriculum, so to speak. I want to come back to how you actually do that, because I really liked in your book, Shauna and Stephanie, how you talked about how you do a session with a group of parents virtually, where you do something that's really meaningful to them, like building a schedule for their kid. What's the schedule going to be like? Why is consistency and rhythm and routine valuable? But before we go there, I want to come back to Paul. Paul, in an article you wrote that kind of introduced me to your work, you mentioned that you have to really focus on relationships. And that's kind of what Stephanie and Shauna have talked about so far, the importance of making sure the relationship is meaningful and authentic. What would you want to share here, Paul, in terms of the import of that and what really a teacher or a principal needs to do to make sure in building those relationships, you really are creating a more equitable situation for kids? Well, uh, I, I think it goes to sort of this transformation from old world approach to new world approach. Um, in a lot of schools, again, present company accepted, but, but I think you'll recognize this practice. And it was embedded actually in the question you asked, Mark, about equity and about wouldn't it just be, you know, the affluent parents coming forward. Parent engagement used to be, <clears throat> well, we'll have a meeting. We'll have a meeting at school or we'll have a PTA and it'll be purely volunteerism. It was a nice to do thing, you know, once or twice a year, we'd call the parents in, we'd have a big assembly and we'd basically talk at them. You know, we'd, we'd give them a series of informationals on what's going on in the school and what they need to do and, and this, that, and the other thing. It wasn't what you call a relationship. It usually wasn't even a dialogue. Uh, then they'd go off to meet with teachers in quick bites, maybe if they were lucky, they'd get uh, 10 minutes of a teacher's time or five minutes to, to have a quick. This is not about building a relationship. So if you want to build relationships, you've got to incentivize that. And in the new world, relationships have got to be important. And it's the obligation of the school to reach out and connect parents, many of whom have no familiarity with schools as they're currently constituted or they're very different from their experience and form a relationship much as we as adults form relationships with other people. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's personal connectivity. Who are you? What's going on in your life? How are you feeling? What are you worried about? How can we be helpful? How do you think your child is doing? Uh, what do you need at home? How can I help you get that? Uh, the, these kinds of elements of just developing a, um, you know, a, 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 a real relationship with each parent. So it's a it's a one on one personal kind of thing. So we have that's where you have to make time. I mean, somebody's got to have the time to do that, to pick up the phone and call um, each family. <clears throat> Uh, to, to call the caregivers, the parents or family members who are responsible and begin to cultivate and grow that relationship. And that's just a capacity that schools haven't had before. And you know, when the uh, pandemic hit, we had a number of SAM principals who were very used to spending lots of time with their classroom teachers, working instructionally and giving feedback and working in PLCs, kind of pull back and were kind of overwhelmed. As they began to realize that they had to schedule their work in order to be effective, both on the management and the instructional side, and they couldn't let the pandemic keep them from doing that, many of them realized that their conversations with teachers had to start in a different place because they were getting pushback from teachers saying, look, I can hardly do this Zoom thing or these different platforms. How can you possibly expect me to also contact parents? Shauna? Talk to me about how you dealt with a teacher like that who said, not one more thing. That's a fantastic question because that's a question that we get very often. So one of the things that Stephanie and I were even discussing this morning is about the onset of parent engagement in the conversation with our staff and our community, that it is not an extra thing, but it's a part of the total school program. So when we begin our onboarding with our teachers at the beginning of the year where we have our back to school and our welcoming of the teachers, we begin with an inclusive conversation about our community. And we start talking about the 
um, differences in our community, the demographics in our community. And we actually do a activity where we build um, a child each that represents the community that we serve. And each person has to intimately think about, you know, how do they create an environment to engage with that child in their community? And what that always draws us back to is that in order for that child to be who they are, that it is that parent and that home structure that creates that child. And so the conversation naturally evolves into, well, how can I get to know that child better if I don't know the parents? And so through that process, we build in structures that allow our parents and our teachers to have time together before the look at the curriculum begins and so forth. So that at the time when we begin planning actual lessons, we are planning with the student and the family in mind. So to a quick answer to that outside of the systems and structures that we've implemented is in the beginning, we make parent engagement and the structures around parent engagement about the work that we're doing from day one. So that way we don't later have to add it in and say, well, now it's time to contact parents. No, parents are contacted within the first three days of school, such as the roaring in the community that we do, or during this um, pandemic, the, I think it was the second day of school, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie, we just devoted it all to calling homes. And so that time was available for our teachers to just connect with homes. And because it was placed as such a priority, in the structures that we had, they understood that it was not an extra responsibility, but really grounded in the work that we do. Well, you took a teachable moment and turned it into an actionable moment where you were able to take the situation and actually move forward in a positive way. A Bibb County principal told me that when he started having conversations with teachers back in March about online instruction, he did it just as a wellness conversation. How you doing? How you feeling? What was the success you had? But then he said, what parent would you like me to contact to see if I can get a better connection here and build that relationship that's so important? Paul, let me ask you, uh, what have you seen in your experience has been the most effective action you've seen a school take, a teacher, a principal, to really change that attitude of the parent needs to be involved, not just on a surface level, but since they're actually working with the child each day, how we actually develop that person. What have you seen this worked well, Paul? Well, it um, you know follows along the line Shauna was talking about is sort of shifting the culture so this becomes, you know, there, there's an imperative, there's an absolute expectation uh, that teachers um, or somebody at school is reaching out and making that connection with parents. Uh, we did some work in the Unity Point District in, in Southern Illinois. Uh, and because at the Ed Redesign Lab, we've been really prescribing that we develop an individualized success plan for each child and that there be a navigator within the school system, a teacher or other staff member who follows that child throughout their experience. We're trying to break down and attack anonymity in the school system. No child, no family should be anonymous anymore. Somebody should know them. Somebody inside should be their advocate. So at Unity Point, uh, you know, they began this school year and having a, a meeting at the beginning of the year between the family, the student, and a teacher. And they began to put together a plan. And people felt good about that. I remember I was visiting that district pre-COVID and in which they were just starting to introduce this idea of individualizing, personalizing, meet children where they are, give them what they need. And the, um, the faculty said, okay, well, we're gonna do this and we'll, we'll set aside, um, I remember one faculty member, I was on a panel with, she said, we, we set aside eight minutes per student for a meeting. And uh, I thought, okay. Uh, and then she went on to describe it. She said that eight minutes quickly turned into an hour and a half. And because I realized I'm getting to know this child in a way that I'd never thought before, but actually, went back to the reason I got into education in the first place, because I love children, I wanna make a difference in their lives, and it's more complicated than just teaching them reading. And furthermore, they won't be able to absorb what I have to say about teaching reading if they're operating under toxic stress or they're inadequately fed or whatever might be the case. So I really felt like as a teacher, I was making a difference. And several teachers in a row said this, that, you know, that this, reminded them of what they went into teaching for. And I talked to the superintendent afterwards 
And I said, wow, this is a big shift in the amount of time they're spending and so forth. Have you had any um, grievances in this in terms of the contract? This was a pretty strong union district. And she said, absolutely not. Nothing's happened. People, you know, the teachers in general love this. So I think part of, part of what will make this work is you know, the value proposition for teachers. If you do this work with families right, teachers' jobs become easier. Teachers can be more effective because they're, they, they've expanded their team for boosting students' learning and they're mitigating some of the problems outside that get in the way of kids coming to school or being intellectually or motivationally present when they get there. So it, it's a win-win if you frame it in the proper way for teachers. And then one last thing I'd say, which I have observed as you asked me for specifics is, I've seen some school districts <clears throat> in which they're building their capacity, not just through shifting the responsibilities for teachers, but, but also bringing other people on board. I've seen in, in uh, the city year program, for example, where you get city or AmeriCorps volunteer uh, members come in and they become the connective tissue <clears throat> between the schools and the families. They who often younger and have more technological expertise uh, than many of our teachers have can help in setting up the technological environment, can help sometimes with languages and translation, can help in translating the curriculum to the family in ways. Uh, so building capacity is not just <clears throat> taking the existing people and expanding their responsibilities, but also welcoming on, on board other people, including other staff who are in the building. Yeah, I, I often say my most effective uh, teacher when I was an elementary principal with 800 students was the day custodian. He was a remarkable guy and kids really liked him. And so he became very important in terms of helping some kids. But I think you're talking about something even broader. You're saying, let's look well beyond what we've done before. How do we really build the relationships with all the people in a community who have interest? And that makes a real difference, I think. Sean and Stephanie, in your parent university, you brought um, content to parents. And you've said, here's something that may be helpful for you. And you've done sessions with them on it. I'm curious, have you seen that teachers have viewed this as a win? as Paul is talking about, that by having a parent who maybe is more comfortable with developing a routine at home for being the home teacher, if you will, assisting in the child's learning in a different way than perhaps they have, have you seen teachers see it as a win? And maybe even more importantly, have you seen parents see it as a win? Stephanie, why don't you start? Oh, absolutely. And when we first set out for our virtual parent universities, of course, it was geared towards our families and we opened it up to our staff. We said, you know, this is not mandatory. It's beyond your contract hours. If you'd like to join us, please do so. Every one of our teachers almost every week joins us for a parent university session. And we really, we sat down as an entire team. Uh, we brought parents on. We had about 80 families, our entire staff. We started off with talking about our mission and vision for this year, the goals for Allenwood, um, how we, we, we would increase parent engagement together. And there were three topics that really came up, or three goals. And we wanted to, of course, have constant communication and information. We wanted to build the capacity of our parents and we wanted them to have a platform where they would feel empowered. So we have this virtual parent university where our parents and educators come together. We usually have some type of expert. The, the topics are chosen by the parents and then at the school level, we find the expert. But more importantly, it's for us to have an open conversation. We want our parents to see the role they have in their child's education as well as what other families are doing. And in doing these parent universities every week, these sessions, our school is just much more connected. Our teachers are reaching out to parents. Parents are reaching out to teachers. It's that two-way communication that we've talked about. And we see our efforts in our data. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had a little bit of an attendance issue. That is not something our school is dealing with right now. Our students show up to school almost 
every day. And we have not seen a drop off. We're reaching the end of the first quarter. So not only do we see that our parents are more connected with each other, our teachers are more connected with our parents, but we also see that our data points are increasing. That is cool. Shauna, what would you add? So just to add to that, as Stephanie was speaking, um, currently I'm in the doctoral program with the University of Maryland focusing on parent engagement. So I really got excited about looking at data points and just thinking about whether or not what we were doing was just um, homogeneous to our environment or whether or not it could be duplicated in other settings. So we had the privilege of working with a nonprofit organization um, in the evening, Stephanie and I, and then we, you know, we were just seeing, you know, is this thing real? Can parents really get engaged? Did they, you, you know, we were just, you know, really passionate and said, maybe it's just our school culture. But we implemented the same process of contacting each parent individually, getting a documentation of what their goals and strategies were, and just duplicated what we had done at Allenwood for this organization. And we started to hear the same feedback. One of the things that we heard was that, you know, they're excited and they started asking for programming. They started asking for um, things that were specific to their children. So for the organization we worked with in the evening, they were focusing on writing, but most of the, um, all of the students for that matter were boys. So it was an organization just for boys and many of them were athletes. So then the parents started asking, you know, how can we get someone who's an athlete to speak to our students? And so we brought that to the conversation. And um, a second very um, poignant part was when we're not talking and the parents begin talking. And we're sitting there and we're just hosting the platform, but they're having conversations, they're connecting, they're exchanging phone numbers. And what has resulted is just one more key point in our staff and in our total community. You ever have one of those staff meetings where you're talking to um, one of your colleagues about a particular student and no one else knows the functionality of that student's life? When we have a conversation about a student at Allenwood, Everyone knows because someone knows who's their cousin, who's their brother, someone has spoken to their mother, they've had a parent university with them or a session. So it's really like a community effort where we honestly know each other's names. So um, I know I kind of went in a couple of places because I kind of get excited about it, but just that genuine connection and a duplication mm -hmm. of the process when you're building a relationship has been evident. And just seeing that resulting in the attendance data, in the student achievement data, and that authentic, that word again, engagement. Because one of the things we do in education so well is use these catchphrases, differentiation, manipulatives. And you go into one teacher's classroom and their manipulatives look like, hmm, and another teacher's classroom looks like, wow, and then integration of technology. And so there's all this variation in what effective um, implementation of these terms become. And so with the parent university and the conversation of engagement, we wanted to be very specific around what engagement looked like and understand that something is coming from the parents and that is extending beyond their contact with us. And they're coming to us and we're going to them because there's something of value there. And it doesn't become something strenuous, but it becomes something as necessary as going to the grocery store. So that's what we really identified as a strength in this process because it's ongoing and the parents are asking us for it. So now we're committed to it. Now we weren't doing it weekly. Now we're doing it weekly. And also our um, teachers do parent universities in their classrooms. So it's really become contagious because it's, um, it, it's, it's genuine engagement. You know, a uh, principal in uh, a rural Missouri school that just started doing SAMS likes to say that PLCs are only real when they're not called PLCs anymore, but they are discussions where people are learning from each other and they're comfortable. And his point is, is that for parent engagement really to work, you have to get beyond the school saying, I'm having a session here, come to it, we're going to tell you what uh, you might do in terms of like routines, for example. And I know you've taken a very different attitude in terms of presenting it that way. You make it much more two way. I'm curious, have you had a parent yet say? I, I can't hear your question, Mark. I'm sorry, are you able to hear me now, Stephanie? Yes. 
Oh, I am so sorry. Have you had a parent lead a PLC in your in your or one of your sessions yet? Have you had a parent say, let me step up to do this? Yes, we've had a parent leader session and we've also had parents. So after we have, you know, what we call our expert that just speaks for a brief time, our parents then take over. Uh, they start offering their own expertise. They start offering their own strategies. And Sean and I were talking about this this morning. We had a parent session on self-care and our parents wanted to know, you know, they said, we have five kids at home. Um, I'm trying to work from home and I'm trying to keep up with distance learning. Because of COVID, we're not leaving the house. You know, financial issues are a problem. I need self-care that, you know, is relevant. They're like, please don't tell me to do yoga. Yoga is great, but please don't tell me to do yoga. We need some real things that we can do to take care because we feel run down. We had this amazing parent university session. It was led by one of our parents. We'll call her Miss Jones. And about halfway through, Miss Jones breaks down, just starts crying. We're like, oh no, she, you know, she's offering these great strategies. She had all the parents engaged. And she kind of goes off topic and she said, I just have to tell everyone, you know, my sister has passed. I have taken in her two children. I have three of my own. And I don't know how to raise children that aren't biologically mine. So she puts that out there to our wow. entire community. And our parents respond. So everyone stops and all these parents start unmuting. And there's, you know, grandma says, I have my son's two daughters. I'm raising children that are not biologically mine. A great aunt says, I'm raising two of my nieces, um, daughters that are not biologically mine. A grandma says, I have four that are not biologic. And these parents that have been in the same school for five, six years that have never had a conversation with each other, they start giving out numbers. You know, we are gonna do this as a village. Please call us right after this parent university session. Those parents are on every single week. They know each other. They now have relationships that are beyond our school. And we just saw how powerful these parent university sessions can be. That is way cool. And it's really great to hear. Paul, question for you. Uh, I had a principal tell me that uh, he didn't want to do parent engagement the way Stephanie and Shauna are doing it because he could barely manage the politics within his staff. Uh, staff members wanted control over what was occurring. He was working really hard building a structure with his professional staff, people who were licensed, so they were willing to share decision making with the non-licensed staff within in the school. Taking it a step further and involving parents really frightened him. What would you say to him? Well, I mean, it sounds like the process that he was engaged in was a governance related process in which they were sharing decision making over certain kinds of issues. And it's not necessary in, in the kind of parental engagement that we're talking about to turn this into a governance discussion with respect to engaging parents. You're engaging parents in the educational mission of the school. And um, obviously they need a voice and say and things that are going on in the school and there are avenues in which they can be, um, you know, in some kind of an advisory capacity. But I think really when we talk about schools developing the capacity um, to do effective parental engagement. Well, you've seen it on display this morning. You have a principal in Shauna who's made this a priority. This is something that is at the top of her list and her team knows that. So if I was superintendent and had a principal who come to me and say, well, you know, my people really don't wanna do it. I would say, well, then it's up to you. Either put up or shut up, you're the leader. This is important to us as a district you find a way to persuade them and make them feel that this is of top priority importance because it's absolutely of top priority importance if we're to be effective as a school district. So this really is a leadership uh, uh, question and, and superintendents have got to assemble a leadership team of principals who put this in first place. I mean, this is the problem, Mark, in the past. This was a sort of nice to do thing. I mean, for some principals, it was actually a nuisance. That was part of the culture. I need to get parents involved, oh boy. Okay, we'll go through the motions and do this. Now we're saying, be proactive on this. 
and make this part of your work. It's like the professional development, the PLCs that you described earlier. It now becomes embedded in who we are and what we do and the way we roll in this place. And, and not as something, oh yeah, when I get around to that, I'll come and do it. It's central. And if you don't have a team that subscribes to that philosophy, uh, I think you need to do some team rebuilding. I think that's a critical piece. And as we like to say, it's all about relationships, right? Principals know that if they're going to be a good leader and assistant principals and teacher leaders, if they're gonna be a good leader, they have to be willing not to know it all, but to say, I want to engage you. And I think that's what Shauna and Stephanie have done here. But they also, as leaders, have to be able to help people find the win. And I think that's a central piece here and why they took a teachable, actionable moment with the pandemic and said, let's make lemonade out of these lemons. We have to change what we do. How could we change things for the better? We have just a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to finish with that. I'd like to start with you, Shauna, and tell me, you've made some changes. Do you think they're going to last? Because we're never going back to the old normal. We have a new normal, and we're going to have another new normal in a few weeks. Every time it keeps changing. Do you think this piece of engaging parents the way you've done it is something that's going to last and be our new normal? That's a great conversation. I know, Mark, you and I have often talked about the new normal, what's going to stay and what's not going to stay. And I think back to what you said about identifying the wins. We always have, all of us have school improvement um, plans and school evaluation plans and these targets that we have to meet. Um, if your goal around parent engagement is not aligned to your school improvement plan, then it's going to fall by the wayside. And so having that at a part built into your systems and structures and knowing, okay, this is one of the structures that I'm going to utilize to meet this goal. So as Stephanie alluded to, attendance. Attendance was our initial focus of how we wanted to, you know, the area where we wanted to target parent engagement. But then again, we saw the successes in other avenues. And so therefore we, you know, grew in other areas to engage families. And what really helped was that we were able to see change by measure. So it wasn't that we just implemented something and said, oh, look, great, it's here. We actually looked at what was happening prior to and what is happening post. And by looking at the data, and like you said, Mark, identifying a win, it then um, continues. Not only does it feel good, but you have fruits of your labor, such as increased attendance, more parents um, engaged in helping their students and data achievement points. So because of those wins, it's likely that a variation, if not the exact duplicate, but a variation of it will remain because we have seen success. Cool. Stephanie, anything you'd like to add to that? Yes. Mark, I don't want to go back to normal. I'm, I mean, we have been given, <laughs> yeah, we've been given this opportunity. And I mean, at the end of the day, students do not spend a nearly enough time with their teachers for teacher-led instruction to make the gains that we wanna make, to reach the national standards that have been set. Our parents, they're, they are our experts of our children. And really at the end of the day, there is no better in individualized instruction than a parent working with their child because no one knows that child better. So we need to continue to work on our partnerships with our parents and continue to give them platforms to be empowered and have a voice at the table. And Paul, I saved the last minute for you because as head and founder of Harvard's Education Redesign Lab, this must be music to your ears. What do you think is gonna happen here in the future? Well, I mean, we, we need to find ways to hold up examples of outstanding practice like we've heard about this morning um, from, from Shauna and Stephanie and, uh, and make that the rule rather than the exception. And, uh, so I think that's what leadership is about. That's what priority is about. There's no question that we're in a time of paradigm shifts within the education sector. You know, again, take technology. We're, we're, technology is gonna leave its imprint on our sector, uh, no matter what kind of new normal we revert to after this. It's going to be with us in different shapes and forms and a much more potent present than we have had to date. I like to think the same thing is going to happen with family engagement. We've learned to cross that boundary. We've crossed that river now and started to take it much more seriously 
in most of our districts around the country of necessity. And that the, um, you know, what emerges is a value proposition. In other words, it turns out to be better to have parental engagement, even though it takes somewhat more time than it was not to do it before, because we're more effective in the long run by, you know, making common cause with our families. So I think, um, you know, strong leaders are going to continue to emphasize the value proposition. They're going to help teachers and other school personnel build the capacity to do this work. They're going to make it safe for them to make the changes in their practice that allow them to do it. And I think eventually uh, the value proposition to each teacher and to each school leader will become readily apparent. We're better with parents than holding them at arm's length. Absolutely. You know, I'm just amazed that 40 minutes has flown by so quickly. Shauna, Stephanie, Paul, thank you so much. It has just been a delight to have you and have this topic be front and center for us. And I think you're right. Oftentimes it gets relegated to, well, if I have time. But you know, that's the whole thing about the SAM process, isn't it? You say, what do I need to do to move forward? What can I do differently? And you get pushed in terms of your thinking every day as you do your time track. And so challenge to everyone online right now, think about what you can schedule tomorrow to move forward on what you did today. How can I take what I did today and make sure that I do something that will engage parents in a meaningful way? This has been really fun, everyone. We're gonna to switch to breakout rooms in just a moment for those of you who would like to stay on. I know many of you are already putting your comments in the chat box and we'll share those with our three presenters. And again, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Shauna. I'm gonna ask Eleanor White to take herself off mute because she is the time change coach for Shauna and Stephanie. And you've been busting to say something. I can see it in your face. What do you wanna say? Shauna mentioned, thank you, thank you. Shauna uh, was talking about being authentic in building relationships. And what came to mind for me was I attended uh, a parent forum and Shauna and Stephanie told their story. We didn't know that the story that was being told was about the two of them, not a dry eye in the house. That's the authenticity that Shauna and Stephanie brings to the work they're doing. I am so proud. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. I think that goes for everybody. Hey, everyone, thanks again. We're going to go to breakout rooms right now. If you'd like to join a breakout room, please do. And right now, the rooms have been created and all rooms are open. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dr. White. <laughs> thank you, Paul. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. White. And thank you, Jim, for managing everything. <laughs> thank you.